Wow, we have uh, a host of uh, guests in the studio uh, for the uh, nominal writers in the round. Um, Michael Cabernus and Clifford Brooks, uh, both uh, writers and raconteurs, as you'll uh, soon discover. And uh, Jason Lyles and Nancy Dwight Siters are both uh, wonderful songwriters. And I thought we'd, we'd start with uh, one of uh, Nancy's songs. Uh, this is a song called uh, Whiskey. Uh, it's recorded. I'm not going to expect you to just jump right in, Nancy. I'm going to play okay. this recording so we can hear it. Especially, I don't know who it is who's playing the slide guitar, but he's he's really he or she is really good. Yes, Mason Vickery. He's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is called uh, Whiskey Tongue. There's a whole bunch more songs like that uh, on the site. It's called uh, The Music of uh, Nancy Dwight Citus. And uh, Nancy is uh, our guest, uh, along with uh, Clifford and Michael and Jason. And I'm listening to that and I'm thinking, uh, um, when, when you're listening to, to, to somebody sing and play, do you get a mental image of what you think they'd look like? Anybody can answer that. Is it, there's, there's no penalty. I think for me, I just delve into the music. I just want to absorb it and 
You don't, you don't have any sense of what the person looks like, or...? You know, if I've never seen them before, then I don't picture them. I've never thought about doing that. Even when you hear somebody's voice? Not necessarily singing, just speaking. I'm not aware of that, frankly. Is hmm. that unusual for people? Is that weird? Uh, I'm often surprised sometimes when I, uh, I hear, hear a radio person or I hear a singer and then like I, I go look up what they actually look like and sometimes it's surprising, <laughs> sometimes it's not. <laughs> that was, in a roundabout way, that's what I was getting at. Right. Um, I mean, look at Nancy, you know, a very nice looking lady, but not the voice that you would expect to hear from Nancy's face, what we just listened to, right? Sounds like a much older person from, uh, well, it's, it sounds almost like American Primitive, like uh, John Fahey or somebody like that, your guitar playing. Oh. And I know you, you're a fan of uh, Elizabeth Cotton, right? Well, <laughs> yes, but... um. I mean, I, I really don't. I've heard that before. It's. Um, I think it's maybe because I think my music is really self-taught, so it's kind of, um, and I've done so much by myself, too. So um, I, I definitely like old blues music and uh, roots music. Uh, so I think it's it's an influence for sure. Oh, I, I think I think it's I think it's fairly evident that it's an influence. Um, but but then again, you know, uh, um, I was just sh sharing with Michael some of the uh, the ways in which he has exposed himself on Facebook. You know, you, you give people your nicknames and you know things, that, rude things that people say about you, that kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, and he's like, "How did you know that?" I mean, we we live in we live in a world now where, where there's no secrets anymore, right? and, and, and everybody seems true. everybody seems somewhat aghast by that. No, you're right. The I, loss I, of privacy. You have to come yeah. closer, Michael. You're, you're quite right. I was a little bit surprised that you had that anecdote, and I wondered if it was something I'd written in a book, said in an interview, or where did that come from? <laughs> but, yeah, there's no telling. It's all out there now. If you just Google it, nothing goes away. The problem is, uh, at least in my experience with that, is that much of what you Google isn't true. Oh, that can be, yeah. You know. And then, and then there's the problem of... Uh, People are interviewed, and uh, I, I finally figured out, don't quote interview answers to people, because invariably they'll say, mm, I don't think I said that. Yeah, right. <laughs> or, uh, no, that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think that... Um, this is Clifford. Um, social media, uh, as much as people want to vilify it, uh, I think that it does come back to, and this kind of loops around to when you when you envision somebody and, and what they what they sound like. Does their voice fit their face? To talk about, the, you know, when I hear music, I'm very much like I I, I I never thought about that before. I'm like you. I thought, well, no, I, I never have. Um, but when I, I know when you when I would hear like Aretha Franklin's voice, and then it comes from somebody so tiny. You know, again, I've I've had that like, wow, I thought that it would be where I, you know. And then when you said, like, you know, I, I, when I play music, it's from inside. I really, I, it, it, so, I mean, I just had this thought, like, is the, the true you is your sound. You know, it's, it's the art that you create. And then the outside is your vessel, you know. And I think that with social media, there, there becomes much more of a presence of appearance because they can immediately see what you look like and they can immediately begin to judge you on what you're quoted as saying. And, and for me, it, get, it became um, extremely frightening because... I am one of those people. I don't keep it real, but I, I sometimes I don't have a filter. And so I've, I've been quoted just kind of thinking when I was talking off the cuff. And thank God it's not been anything inflammatory, but it did it did not make my mom happy when it got out. <laughs> so for me, it's just it's, it's helped me be aware that, you know, at any time, you know, there could be somebody. With, and it's not a paranoia. It's just when you're in, you're in, a, in a situation where you're especially performing to be aware of. It's just common sense to know that probably what you're saying, what you're doing is, is being taped or, or caught on film. I, I've really learned to think twice before committing something to internet in any sense, be it Twitter or Facebook or whatever. When I'm making a comment on anything, I think to myself, okay, so who's this going to offend and how is it going to be misread or misunderstood? And, and let, me, let me just take care of that misplaced apostrophe. <laughs> Got to deal with the grammar first. My wife said to me uh, some time ago, um, whatever you write in an email, Imagine that that makes the front page of the paper tomorrow. If you don't want what you've written, then, you know, don't do it. Oh, that's very good advice. But then 
Um, I, I, I certainly think it's true of um, uh, musicians and performers, but I'm wondering if it's equally true of writers, that while um, we have this kind of uh, romantic notion of the artist exposing their soul, um, most performers assume a persona. Um, I, 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 I didn't, I, when I got into reading and performing my, my, my material, I, I think fortunately just said, okay, well, this is going to be me, you know, because to create a persona and, and there's a safety in that. But for me, that the energy to, to be two different people, uh, was too taxing in my imagination. I always went back to the, the brilliance of Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens. He was the same dude, not just literally, but like he did not change his character from one to the other. He just had, the, you know, the, the pseudonym Mark Twain, so he could say, you know, whatever's on his mind. And people say, oh, well, you can't get mad at Sam. That wasn't him. You know, I, I think that there's a, a delicate line to be walked between once picking up another persona because it tap dances into the, the fabrication part and then getting caught so easily in what people would consider a lie with social media and whatnot. Hmm. We'll go back to that. Uh, let me introduce you. Uh, my guest, uh, Clifford Brooks, uh, born in uh, Athens in Georgia. He has two uh, collections of poetry, The Draw of Broken Eyes and Whirling Metaphysics, which is almost a poem in itself, I think. Um, and then a second full-length uh, volume of poetry called Athena Departs, Gospel of a Man Apart. He also has a limited edition uh, chapbook called uh, Exiles of Eden. Clifford is also, and perhaps uh, notably for people who listen to, to the station, uh, the founder of uh, the Southern Collective Experience, which is a, a cooperative of <coughs> writers and musicians and visual artists. And Clifford not only publishes and edits a, a journal called the Blue Mountain Review, but he also hosts a, a radio program on the station uh, on the third, is that right, the third Sunday? Third Sunday of each month. I produce a thing and I still can't remember what day it is. The third Sunday of every month. And I have to say, Clifford, the, the, the show was, was, was uh, as much as anything the inspiration for what we're doing now. Thank you. Uh, watching you and, and watching you talk to, to writers and musicians um, made me realize that um, so much can be added to people's appreciation of, of, of the work of others if you give them the opportunity to talk about who they are and what they do. I agree. And it struck me that to bring people like yourself and Nancy and Jason and Michael together in the room and then see what happens, that, that often produces some really interesting uh, conversations. Would you care to show, share a poem? Um, I do. Um, I would. It's um, from my second collection, Athena Departs, Gospel of a Man Apart. And it embodies the whole idea and practice and humor in meeting someone, not wanting to meet someone. That's typically when you meet someone, how do you behave? Men are clumsy, when women are very observant, and there's a comedy that plays out there. And um, my my goal as with the show as with my poetry is not to create an inflammatory situation but to um to foster um laughter because when you're when you're laughing when you find a humor humor in something then you've removed stress for at least that moment and this poem is called hypothetical date with calypso there is no better night than one when cupid refuses his fickle flight i do not want intimacy there is no room for brooding or dreams. Yet, due to the DNA of fate, we attend the same soiree. I smoke, and the smell of it irritates you, but you refuse to be difficult. And I light another in delight. You make it my last by lifting both my hands to dance. You stay to say you might want to talk in spite of the fear you feel. Tonight we are owls or blue herons, delicate fowl. Our eyes agree to feast too fast. 
brilliant you, resilient you. I glance at your breasts while it appears you're not paying attention. But that's a trick, because no man before 40 is cool enough to catch cleavage without claws coming out. However, I never claimed to be clever. Breathe, my sweet. Breathe, because deep, deep, deep beneath the ocean of us, there is a reef that keeps the outcome of our courtship a secret. My fixation on your flesh forces me to fidget like a hound-hunted fox. You kiss my cheek and compliment my socks. Woman, you don't want this. And even if I told you how alone loving me leaves a lady, you'd stay. You see, my heart is not a cruel knot, but what beats is not made of muscle. God clamped a clock inside that no one bothered to wind. Clifford Brooks. Is it possible, um, and, and I think maybe it's an assumption that some of us make, uh, well, let's just say it's an assumption I make, that um, poets particularly, um, there's, there's, there's a measure of self-exposure in the work that you do. Yes. Um, I, 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 yes. But at the same time, you're a public persona, right? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to be entirely yourself and and perform and, and if that's the case is the performance of self in fact true or is it just what we want the world to see just like the rest of us when i perform it's it's probably no i, I know it's, it's the only time that, that i am um at, at, at absolutely at peace with me um with prose and i, I my, the first 15 years or so that i wrote i wrote exclusively prose and and, and with prose, with fiction or even nonfiction to a degree, you can um, you can put a filter on who you are. Or if you have some undesirable parts about you, you can cast it off into another character and say, oh, well, that's not me. That deplorable person is my neighbor or whatnot. With poetry, you're standing naked. And I, I believe in songwriting, much the same. Like, that, that's you. You know, you have to, in order to draw in people to care, you have to, you have to funnel out a significant portion of, of yourself. And it makes you... I keep saying you, but I mean, it, it, I'm not trying to force it on other folks, but it, it makes me feel it's extremely vulnerable, you know. Um, uh, but like I said, when if I tried to uh, create a persona, if I tried to build a, a wall around me or a facade, I believe that it would do an injustice to the crowd, and, and they would feel that 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 it was fake, and they would they would they would um they would withdraw. When it's just me, uh, it, it's it's much easier on me. It's it, to to perform. It, it's much more frightening. When you feel about people taking you wrong, or you know, will they will they like what I'm doing? But um, trying to be two people it would it, it would draw away from my art, and I'm not trying to make it all flighty. But um, getting up in front of people is always, you know, if you're not a little bit nervous, I feel like you've lost your game, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I get up and, and I just kind of uh, purge myself, uh, I'm able to taper that with words, put it on the page, so I'm not spilling all like I am now. But um, you know, I, I I do believe that it, it does the artist, um, no matter their genre, far more justice. If they strip away the facade and be themselves when they when they read and deal with that vulnerability, asking a lot though, isn't it? Yeah. How, how do you feel about that, Nancy? Is, are you comfortable with that notion of uh, when you when you sing your songs that, you, that you're sort of opening yourself up to people? Well, um, that is something that that I can struggle with sometimes. So there are some songs that I have a hard time performing. Um, other songs that are easier to perform because they've been inspired by something else and in, where there might be hints of something that I relate to in the song, it's not quite so exposing, you know. Um, so I would say my favorite songs are ones that are not the most exposing songs, <laughs> <laughs> but I know that other people prefer the ones that are are really um, personal. That's so. that's always struck me, you know, as as the paradox of of uh, public performances by songwriters. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
there are times when when you write a song, I'm assuming, um, much as you might write in a journal, mm -hmm. in that it's something you're trying to work through, and maybe by putting it into words, you can come to terms with it. Well, I don't think it's intentional. For me, when I'm writing, it's it's very much flow, and um, I might have sort of a picture of some some image in my head, and then it'll just sort of fall into to music and rhythm, and and it's there. And then when I look back at it, I think, oh wow, I don't think I can sing that for anybody. <laughs> um, and uh, and sometimes I won't for a long time, but then I, but then I do, and and it is really fun to perform them after a while. And I think they're kind of powerful. Yes. Do, do, do they always feel like they're yours? Or somebody t told me recently, you know, that once you start performing it, it's not really yours anymore, because because you've given it to the listener, and the listener's going to interpret their way, and it becomes something outside of yourself almost. Sure, but I, I think um, one of the most beautiful things about performing is is. Uh, when I have performed and ha there are people that come up to me and, and will say something, a stranger will say something about a song or something that it meant to them. And, and then it feels kind of like a shared moment with them. And, and there's this um, sort of community to the, to the music when that happens. And, and the cool thing is that you've artic you, you may very well, and I, th I think probably Jason would, would agree with this, you, you've articulated a, a feeling that others have shared, but don't know how to put into words. Maybe, maybe. it's. I, I think the first time that happened to me, I, I performed at the Bluebird in Nashville, and a, a woman came up and talked to me afterwards about one of my songs, and that was one of the most uh, amazing moments, um, perhaps in my early 20s at that time. <laughs> it was a long time ago, but I remember that really well. Well, that, that, that's, that's such a, a feeling of vindication huh? as, as a writer. When somebody comes up and says, "Wow, that really spoke to me," or that, that, "That really meant something to me." Yes, I was terrified that night. I think there were there were five of us on stage, and they kept coming around. It was a writers in the round, and they kept coming around. And I thought, "Oh, surely <laughs> there's not going to be that last song. I'll, I'll be, you know, I've written all of I've I've only written like five songs at this point. So when it kept coming around to me, I kept having to make up songs. It was terrible." <laughs> Oh. Clifford was saying, if you're not nervous, then uh, you're off your game or something right. to that effect, yeah. didn't you, Clifford? Uh, uh, I think this is a friend of yours that wrote this night. It's really nice. It's uh, talking about you on, on your website, talking about, you know, stuff that's on the web. Um, it says, uh, born of another time and place, Nancy Siders was raised on the Suwannee Plateau in Tennessee. While her friends idolized Twisted Sister and White Snake, she was busy listening to Hank Williams, Robert Johnson and Elizabeth Cotton. It didn't matter that these were the only records in her parents' collection. She had no need for the glitz and glamour. Years went by and she honed her skills, constantly digging deeper into the roots of American music. In the lovely country music mecca known as Nashville, she recorded two records. And then uh, that song that we listened to earlier, I think is from one of them, isn't it, Nancy? Yes, that was yeah. the first one. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Uh, but the city sequence sheen was not for her. It, it, it seemed to have lost its way. At least Twisted Sister realized its caricature status and so nancy packed up and headed west to settle in the tiny mountain hamlet of leadville in colorado for a while so disgusted by the image driven scene she considered giving up on music altogether but some things are inescapable as uh, i think again jason will attest some things run through the blood thankfully for us she pulled out her guitar again yes friends nancy is the real deal <laughs> would you Care to play something? Um, sure. I, I actually, um, when is it Clifford? Clifford, when Clifford was talking about the heart, the clock winding, mm. I have a, a song that I wrote about. Um, it was inspired by this this uh, movie called um, Jack and the Cuckoo Clock Heart, and uh, his heart was. Do you know the movie? I did. Okay. I know this one. <laughs> okay, so his heart when he was born was frozen solid, and so um, anyway, that basically he. Uh, um, he was not to ever fall in love or he w his heart wouldn't be able to survive. And so um, this song is a sort of, it's a love song about um, the one that he falls in love with and she, she can't see. So um, she, 
-hmm. or she's legally blind. And so he finds all these glasses and give, gives her a bouquet of glasses. And this song is about um, an invention. It's kind of a takeoff on that, but an invention that um, you could wear that would show no flaws in other people. Maybe, baby, I don't need too much I kind of got that Midas touch Or all I see In the evening when you're standing close I feel the heat in my chest Smokes in your go. Dust from my eyes. Is it's my new invention? Spectacles that show no flaws. So feel the floor when you're walking around, and keep it light when you touch the ground around. Fly With four feet we can stumble around I'm not the only one to tumble down It's all right Cause I don't want the sunrise Shake the gold dust from my eyes Sets my new invention Spectacles that show no flaws Nancy Dwight Siders is, I guess, I love the way you play. It, 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 you, you sit yourself taught, but it, that's a really uh, unusual way of, of playing the guitar that you have. I think so. It's because I'm a guitar, I'm a living room guitar player. <laughs> oh, yeah? I and, call and it, how does that uh, play into it? Well, I call it parlor rock. Because <laughs> 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 uh, I play in my house. It's really my main, <laughs> my main thing. So, and by myself. So, so I'm all, always just noodling on my guitar. Yeah, but how did you uh, how did you learn to play like that within that style? It's not. It's... I have no idea. This is just the it's the way I plug the guitar. Really? Yeah, yeah. How did how did you learn? Did you did you learn from from imitating somebody else? No, no. I I just I, I don't know. I think I like the the I, well I, maybe banjo. Watching people claw the banjo some, maybe that's what I picked up on. 
So, because I do a lot of plucking with many fingers at the same time. Wow. <laughs> and it's, also, it's, it's, like it's, it's really a, a kind things. of unconscious process for you, huh? I think so. Mm -hmm. But that's interesting. My, Is that true for you uh, too, Jason? Um, yeah, kind of. I am also self-taught. I never took lessons or anything. I just kind of, uh, I had friends who played, and I just, you know, learned chords and just banged them out and imitated music that I liked. And uh, now here, decades later, I am <laughs> <laughs> putting out albums. Hmm. You uh, grew up in Southern California. Is that right? No, I grew up in North Georgia. Oh, you did? Okay, yes. now I've got you confused with somebody else. You, uh, what I do know about you, because we had this conversation the other day. Right. <laughs> you you, you started, started out playing rock and roll, and you were in a rock band. Yes, that's true. A um, couple of bands, actually. And um, so I played, you know, I, I was the classic, formed a rock band in high school, played at the school talent show, all that good stuff, and then, you know, just kept with it through college and stuff, played frat parties and things like that, and so um, always recorded full band stuff, but then after a while I started just doing more solo acoustic gigs, and so kind of changed my music and changed the way that I perform. But um, as I recall from our conversation, it's, it's almost like a circle. You s started out in a rock band. You shared the rock band and started playing solo, but now you play gigs with if it's not a band, there are other musicians on the stage with you. And uh, the sound of it is uh, reminiscent of some of the bands in the 80s. That's right. It's kind of like a 80s pop rock uh, with uh, cello and acoustic guitar and mandolin. It's kind of, I uh, kind of branded it Power Popicana. So uh, that's kind of my name for it. So... Uh, what I'm getting at the moment from both you and Nancy is uh, a reluctance to dig too deep into what you do and at the same time um, not, in, not entirely comfortable with embracing the notion that what you're doing is truly individual, that you don't really sound like anyone else, which is, I mean, you know, that's, that's not an easy thing to do with a guitar at this point in time when so many people have picked one up and played it, you know, and, and written songs with it. Right. Um, that's, I think that's, I'm always, you know, really impressed by anybody who can find a, a unique voice with an instrument that has been played by so many people. Right, right. And so I, I just, I guess it's because I've listened to so many different things over the years and I've just kind of soaked all that up like a sponge. And so I have so many different influences. I guess it ends up being kind of eclectic, which is kind of a, of a blessing and a curse like you said it's it's nice that you you can do something unique but it's it's a lot harder when you're trying to brand yourself and <laughs> and get um get gigs and promote and things like that hmm. I, I think that um that is a brand mm -hmm. um much like clifford's poetry or michael's stories um it's hard for me to imagine anyone else doing them, or, or Nancy's songs. I mean, that, that song that Nancy just played, can, I can't imagine anybody else doing that. Right, you know? right. If they did, they'd either sound just like Nancy, or they'd have to you know, completely sort of turn it around. Mm-hmm. You know? Right. That's pretty cool, don't you think? Yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I certainly, uh, you know, I believe in, in what I'm doing, or I wouldn't do it, but... Um, you know, it's funny to, um, you know, put yourself out there. You know, you're talking about exposing yourself like you were before. And uh, especially when you have songs that you've, you know, they're expressing emotions from you, but are also maybe about other people in your life. Or, um, you know, I'm always thinking, uh, well, I'm playing this gig and there's other music musicians in here. And, you know, they're probably judging me and <laughs> things like that. So I'm always, you know, kind of self-conscious of, of my own skill and my own performance in, in front of others. Yeah, and, and I, 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 I completely get that. Mm -hmm. And, and I, th I think what's, what's so interesting about the creative process, and I think it's, it, it, it applies to most people, I, nothing applies to everybody, right? But, but I think it applies to most people that it starts out 
as a fairly uh, self-conscious process. But at some point, and, and that's what really fascinates me, is what Nancy was saying before, that it becomes a kind of unconscious process where you sort of tap into the muse that is not whatever that is, you know, um, that idea, you know, that Keith Richard jumped out of bed in the middle of the night, didn't really wake up, but played the uh, riff for satisfaction and then went back to sleep. Right. You know, he right. wakes up in the morning and it's like, oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah and I have, I have what you were saying before is how the song becomes not about you anymore because a lot of times I'll start writing a song that's about a specific situation or specific feeling and then it just it becomes more generalized and being able to uh, more apt to be applied to other people and their situations and so then it becomes um, just a shared thing mm -hmm. like this was something that I've felt that I've gone through and then someone else in the audience may have felt it too and then like Nancy was saying someone might come up to you after a show and say yeah that one song that really spoke to me and so you know that's that's such a great feeling that you can uh, connect with somebody on that level I think so too and, and what what really fascinates me is, is, is uh, we were talking only about persona is that the persona which um, you know Clifford doesn't like that idea because it, uh, of the notion that maybe that's less than honest mm -hmm. but it's by assuming that persona that you can be honest right you definitely when you get up there and you sing it you know you're you're singing this song and it not maybe not specifically about you or your situation but that generalization is what make creates the connection between right. other people and um, when you get on stage I definitely try to put on a show and be a performer and to engage and interact with the audience. Um, but I think a lot of that is really just me, you know, because I'm, that's kind of the way I am, so. <laughs> right. So it's somewhere between the two. Between right. A, between a conscious and an unconscious thing. Right. But we also play so many different roles in our lives, yeah. too. I'm, yeah. I am Jason the musician. I'm Jason the father. I'm Jason the teacher. I'm Jason the son. You know, so many different roles we do play. It's just another hat we put on when we get on stage. And you have that in common with Nancy, who is also a teacher. Oh, okay. And a mum. She has, she has two boys. Do you... Um, does it feel different to you when you're standing in front of a classroom of children than when you're standing in front of an audience and performing? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable in front of my students. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. I've, I've even, you know, what's strange is that I'll take my guitar in front of my students and, and I'm more nervous around them playing music than just going over um, science information. <laughs> because I, I, I think that, and, and maybe it's, it's um, a little different in grade school in as much as you, you, you tend to spend quite a lot of time with them. Mm -hmm. and, and they may be a little more open to you than the students at the college level, you know. Sure. So they start to feel like family, I mm -hmm. would think. Is that, is that true? Oh, sure. Um, my, I teach middle school level, and so they, but we spend quite a bit of time together. And, uh, mm -hmm. it's, and have, since it's a whole year, really develop relationships with each child, and um, it's pretty... Pretty much family. And it just, it just struck me that, that they are at the age, they don't know from persona, mm -hmm. but they certainly are beginning to figure it out that in order to function in the world, you have to kind of assume an identity, mm -hmm. a public identity. Mm -hmm. But you see right through that. For their ages. I think they try, they tr at that age, they try out quite a few different things. They'll, they'll change their name for the first time, um, you know, try out a different type of style with their clothes. They are, they're testing and practicing the persona, I think. And it's all there in your hands. Well, I watch it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a powerful role that you have. Yeah, they, they definitely try on different personas, you know. Uh, I tell them the first day of school, you know, tell me the name you want to go by. And if they say Raven the first day, you're going to be Raven the rest of the semester. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good way to teach them the downside of it. <laughs> Nancy, would you care to do another song? 
Um, sure. Um, you know, I was thinking about the writing process um, when you were talking about this, and um, I had I did have a, an interesting song that came while I was driving my car one time. Is, is this before or after you replace the tire? I think this. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, it is a weird. It's weird finger picking too. So it's got a weird rhythm to it. Um, but we should we should explain the tire reference. Um, oh. Nancy had a tire that there was so, apparently something seriously wrong with it, right? And it was making a clicking noise. Yes, much like many maintenance things in my life, I'm supposed to take care of the drain around my house, that kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, so the so the car the car wheel was making a click sound, and it was great for for writing music because I write a mu write music when I'm driving my car. It's always in my head, and um, and so I wrote a couple songs with this special beat, and then um, I decided <laughs> finally I I would go and get that taken care of. And when they picked up the car, they were like, "It's gonna fall off. The tire's about to fall off of your car. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good thing." <laughs> um, How's this? I haven't played this for a while. She wants to fall down, down on her knees, but begging don't too much for these kinds of places. She wants to forget all the words they say, but sometimes what you bleed is. Just what you need No, my jeans She don't know Where her house is Got a whole world Beds up in boxes Lady don't mind If you cross her And she Wants Unbroken things Like a bird On a string Something that you can't see, something that you can't feel. Starts with a fever, and then there's a chill. No, swear you'll never go back. Oh, but she will. No, my chance, she don't know where her house is. Got her whole world packed up in boxes. Lady, don't mind if you cross her and she wants some broken things like a bird on a string. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She don't know who to call on the phone. The flames they fall, and she don't understand what happened to her hands. And she kneels on the kitchen floor, and the walls came tumbling down. But you know one thing's true: there's no cure. But no, my Jean, she don't know where her house is. Got a whole world packed up in boxes. Lady, don't mind if you cross her and she wants unbroken things like a bird on a string. Yeah. Thanks, Nancy. Nancy uh, Dwight Side is our guest, uh, along with uh, Clifford Brooks, Jason Lyles, and Michael, who's been kind of quiet tonight, Michael Cabernus. Um, Michael has a, a very pretty accent, if you haven't uh, heard it yet. He's from uh, originally from, from Gloucestershire. Well, none of this is true, of <laughs> course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
You're not from Gloucestershire? Originally from Chicago. Oh, you are? Yeah, initially. Uh, I lived in Chicago. See what I mean about the bloody internet, you know? You can't <laughs> trust anything. Oh. But, uh, yeah, I was born in Chicago, in Cook County, actually, just outside Chicago, but um, moved to the UK when I was only six. Ah, that explains it. Yeah, so when I moved to the UK, I suffered the indignity of being bullied for having an American accent. And now I'm being embarrassed for having a British one. But thank you, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you said something earlier that I, I, I kind of found interesting. It was about the idea that one becomes, in a sense, naked when one presents oneself publicly and presents mm. one's work. And I never thought that was really true about me at all, because as a writer of novels and things, I sit behind my typewriter or my keyboard and so on, and I'm fairly anonymous. I don't really have a public persona at all. I don't, I mean, I've, yeah, I've done a few cons and a few videos and things like that, but it's really not much out there you can look to. I don't do public appearances per se. But I realized there's a lot going into my books, more than I thought, because as we were discussing this, I started thinking about one particular scene and one particular character in, in this book, and I realized it was channeling an enormous amount of guilt that I felt for years over the deaths of several of my friends when I was in my early years, in my late teens and 20s and so on. And I had three friends that committed suicide, not as a pact and not all at once. It was over a period of like 10 years. But over the period, I lost several friends. And I felt terrible about that because I, you know, like many people, I suppose, going through that sort of situation, I felt there probably could have been something I could have done and should have done, and maybe I could have been more aware. And I felt guilty about that for such a long time, and it's only recently that I started thinking about it. And I wrote a character in this book called Blue Water, and his name is Joe McAllister, and he's a, a drunk, he's a derelict, he's a bum. He has absolutely no redeeming characteristics at all because he carries this burden of guilt that just destroys him and eats away at him and so on. And I never really put these pieces of a puzzle together before in the sense that he was actually a reflection of me. I also carry that guilt and it also eats at me, even now. And it's 30 years later, I still don't stop thinking about it. And I, you know, it's a bit of a cliche, I suppose, to say that writing is a cathartic experience, but I think it probably has been much in that regard for myself. And, um, well, I'd like to read a piece, if I may. Please do, yeah. Yes, oh. very good. So we're going to read a little bit about Joe McAllister, who's the anti-hero in this book. He's not the main character. He's one of the supporting cast. And he was a minor. And uh, this scene occurs... This is just a very small piece of the scene. It occurs after, you know, years and years and years, decades later, he survived a mining accident that took several of his friends. So I'm just going to read a little bit. I think I'm going to start here. Okay. With a sigh, Joe levered himself up from the bus stop, slightly shaky on his feet. He missed Ricky's father, Lucas, his best friend then and now. Hell, he missed them all. Joe took a deep breath and straightened up. He stood tall, face turned towards the early morning sun. All the pitmen looked to the sky when they came out of the mine like it was their salvation. You could feel the light enter your body and wash you clean. Only it didn't work for Joe anymore. The dark would not leave him no matter how long he stared into the sun. And I wrote that, I suppose, that character was a tribute to these friends of mine. And I, I, I enabled Joe to redeem himself, ultimately. You'd need to read the book, of course, to see how that happens, but at the very end... He becomes the hero that people said he was. He became, he fulfilled his own destiny in a way. He found his own salvation. So, I found it perhaps a little bit more revealing than I had anticipated. I hadn't realized I was putting quite as much of myself into these books. I thought it was fantasy, just imagination. Turns out I was wrong. When, when did you start writing? I suppose in my 20s, I started dabbling. Um, I've always had a sort of penchant for writing and reading and so on. I've been a voracious reader since I was a tiny tot, practically. I was a late reader. I had to go to remedial reading to catch up with all my peers. Because, you know, as I said, I came from the US to, to England, and I missed a year of school somehow. And when I actually started, I was behind. Everybody else could read and write by that point except me. So I was the dunce in the class. So I had to go to remedial studies. Well, I think the the, uh, the the Brits start children in school earlier 
than here in America. That may be true, yeah. I mean, I was certainly well behind. Like I say, everybody else was reading, you know, at a proficient level at that point. They knew their ABCs. I, I barely knew mine at all. But when I caught up with them, I overtook them rapidly. I'm not one for sitting, you know, and resting on my laurels. So I, uh, I took to reading like a duck to water and, and started reading. When I was nine, I was reading, you know, really advanced books for that age. They say, I don't remember what they were anymore. But my mother used to send me up to the library with her library card. And in that time, I don't know how it is now, a child couldn't get an adult book out. But I had special dispensation from the library because my mother wasn't that able physically. So they kind of knew she couldn't get up and out. So they let me take books out for her, but I wasn't taking them for her at all. I was taking them for myself. And so I would get through at least four novels a week, typically. And these were anything. Catch-22 I read when I was 12. I think that's one of my favorite books. I read it every couple of years still. Love it to bits. And um, yeah, I came to reading like a professional. And it wasn't until some kind of, I don't know, epiphany occurred to me one day in Norway, I was just suddenly aware that all the reading I had done in my life had prepared me. I was finally ready to write. And I, I honestly don't know what that was, what the tipping point was, but I felt like I was a vessel that had been filled up to the point where there was no point trying to cram anything more in now. It's time to start letting stuff out. And that was it. Five years ago it started and it hasn't stopped. So it's four novels now, 12 short stories in print, 60 publications, various different things. Um, it's gone quite well in terms of output, let's say. That's sufficient for me. And one thing that I, I feel is important for me is that I don't really care what people think of it either. I don't write for them. I don't write for an audience. I don't write for anybody except myself. And if it, if it meets my criteria, if it meets my you know, acceptable level of what I want, then I'm happy. I write entirely and purely for myself. I write what I want to read. I just hope that somebody else might be interested in writing or reading what I like to read as well. It's a vain hope, but <laughs> you never know. Hmm. Um, the, 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 the first thing that struck me when you were saying that is, is that is the ideal place to be as a creative where you only you only ever seek to please yourself. And you don't care about it. You don't see it as a business it enterprise. Does sound you don't entirely see it. arrogant. I understand that. No, and not at all. It's yeah. a, you're not trying to sell tickets. You're not trying to sell books. No, but it's you, true. You're just it's writing true, yeah. for, your, for your own edification. And if somebody else enjoys it, that's great. But if they don't, however, as a that business wasn't really model, your goal. No, as a business model, though, as a professional writer, it's kind of counterintuitive and rather stupid, because I don't really make any effort to market. I don't really make any effort to push the books. I mean, I've. I've done a sterling service today. I've mentioned my novel's title twice in this entire session, <laughs> which was more than the last time, I'm sure. I didn't mention it at all, hardly. But the fact is, I generally don't care too much about promotion. I am only interested in, in the art and the craft. And I'm really interested in getting better at it and doing better. But I'm not interested in other people judging that. I judge myself. Oh, we all do that. Right. Well, It's the, the curse of the creative, right? right? What do you think about that, Clifford? I see you nodding your head. I could not agree more. I could not agree more. I could. I mean, it, seriously, it's like it's like trying to, to hold my mouth to, to stop from screaming "Amen." I mean, it, it's. I believe that the reason people will read you is because you don't cater to anybody. Because, and I, and I think that I, I, if and I was just talking about this earlier at the, at the camp house, if you enjoy sitting down and writing it, if you laugh at your own jokes, if you hate the characters that you're supposed to hate and fall in love with those that you create to love those who read you will love it for the same reason. And I think that if people, those that, and I can understand, like, I mean, I'm not sitting here knowing all the answers. I do not. But I mean, what I have learned is that like, I try to say, okay, I like writing this, but how can I tweak it more to, because when you stop from, okay, I like this, but then you're looking to something else that's hot right now and trying to mimic that somewhat. And people, again, are going to see that fakeness. They're going to, they'll see where you're you and then where you're not and where you're you and where you're not. And with poetry and my writing, it was the same thing. I mean, I, I can't, I always thought it was so cliche and hokey for people to say, I never wrote this to get published. I never wrote this for people to hear it. And then here it is where everyone wants to hear it and everybody wants to read it. And it's because you don't care. And, and, and but to say that, I, you know, at least I get an idea of someone going, I keep it real, which really means today I'm offensive and I'm a shock jock and I'm here to say swear words for no reason. And I don't see that. I mean, with, with you and when you're, when you're reading, 
you slow down and, and there's that inflection and, and, and you don't say, okay, well, I'm going to try and purge this or I'm going to try and get this point across. You're just writing something that makes you happy. And I think that's what, but in songwriting too, it's like what you were, you were saying earlier, like people always want to hear the songs that, 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 that are the hardest to, to sing and it's because you're touching something in them that's, that's the hardest to get to, I think. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Have you ever written anything, uh, Michael, that like Nancy thought, wow, I'm not sure I want to share this with anybody else? Mm, yeah, I have. There's a lot of stuff that's not published. Come a little closer. There's a lot of work I've written that's not published. I've never sought to, to release it at all. Uh, I think perhaps it's because I'm conscious of the fact that I'm working through things with that. I started writing a novel which I called The Bachelor's Cookbook. And the idea would be that it would be a, um, a seduction manual for single men, how to seduce women through the kitchen. Never mind the way to the man's heart is through a stomach. This, I think, would be a nice counterpoint for the, for the modern day, as it were. The, the, the man who can cook, you know, should do well. And the idea there was to, <laughs> was to, to write a cynical uh, how-to, um, let's say, blueprint to get women into bed. And um, I, I stopped writing that because it, I felt it was an appalling thing to actually publish or even to write. But the actual characters in the book itself, I know people like that. And I know people that think that way. And there are people that genuinely would want to buy that book. And in fact, I, even though this, it might even be successful, I wouldn't publish it at all. Because um, I'm not really interested in that as a mechanism for creating connections or relationships. So what I started doing was having penned quite a large portion of this sort of manual, I started rewriting it to the perspective where it would be a book about redemption, about a, a philanderer who ultimately comes to sort of see the error of his ways and eventually becomes, of course, a little bit of a nicer guy. And, you know, but then it became cliched and I got tired of it. <laughs> it sounds like a bunch of movies I've seen, I'm sure. But, um, yeah. Wow. There's, there's so much in, in what you just said. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that, that occurred to me was uh, that line from Joni Mitchell, uh, it's life's illusions, I recall. Mm. We all, you know, foster these illusions. I don't think there are any more uh, richly fostered illusions than those illusions about men and the way that we all think we can persuade women that we are something we're not or that we are offering something we can't as if somehow women as we all know are not smarter than us and are already way ahead of the game and they've already sorted all that out mm. and they're just watching you dance isn't that right Nancy? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> just a minute oh, your oh. microphone's not on sorry. Oh. <laughs> I had something really profound I said right before the microphone came on. I just <laughs> want to say that. <laughs> but you know, he, could, he said you could probably, you could probably sell a lot of copies of a book like that. Yeah. You know, and it's all about marketing. And you know, as for me, I try to, I try to market myself definitely because I want to, you know, put it out there. But mainly, it's you know, it is for my own satisfaction. Well, you know, the idea that you market yourself is also something that I now reject as well. I don't care anymore mm -hmm. uh, about people's perception of me as an individual mm -hmm. i'm only here to really now please myself right and i hope to be a good person and i try to be a good father and so on but i won't be held to a standard right and i'm not interested in trying to be something i can't be mm -hmm. or don't want to be i mean I've, i there's ways i could improve dramatically as an individual physically and emotionally and spiritually lots of ways but there have to be ways that i want to improve right and pursuits that i want to follow I, I refuse now to be molded or mm -hmm. channeled. Right, and the the songs I write are the songs that I like to listen to. You know, I take all of those influences and filter them into something that is very personal and very me. And, you know, what I'm trying to do when I market myself is just to try to get gigs and play shows that pay for my writing and recording and instrument main maintenance that makes it self-sustaining so it really is that's the is. dilemma though that's the dilemma you have yeah. to do a certain amount of selling in order to be able to pursue mm -hmm. the, the passion right but when i what i do when i do my shows you know i do a lot of covers and i do covers that i enjoy and it's songs that people know and songs that i enjoy and so it's kind of a 
that's also a self satisfaction thing too. So it's kind of like a give and take. Now, as far as my songwriting <laughs> goes, I don't change it for trends or anything. I just kind of write from the stuff that I like and filter it into mm. my my music. But I, I agree with that. That's why I'm not writing a a, a zombie book at the moment or, God bless you. Or, or some nonsense with zombie vikings right <laughs> which is you know that would probably be quite a popular one avoid trends i think i was like that ever since i was a teen i, I hated anything that was popular or you know cool mm -hmm. you talk about personas as a kid when you're trying to grow up i rejected personas but I, by doing so i understand that i must have been creating one too but I wasn't going yeah, to that, that's, that's exactly what, what, what I kept thinking, Michael, is, is that whether you're proactive or reactive, you're still being molded. It, it's the paradox no, of being right. human that we, right. we can't escape it. And the irony yeah. is, you know, 30 years later, I kind of love the Sex Pistols now. <laughs> Maybe they're at the time. Depeche Mode can't get enough. Yeah. yeah. Band of Ballet, I can still forget about them, <laughs> frankly. But, um, you know, some of those musical trends that came about that I thought were awful at the time, I, I kind of dig them now a lot and I see a lot of value in their in their work and what they did so I kind of feel I might have been a little bit too objectionable you know too quick to react negatively to things just because they were popular so I'll admit it you know I do like quite a lot of modern music now I'm mm -hmm. not so close-minded as I was I think maybe you reacting as much as anything just the way it's packaged and presented mm. it, can, yeah. it can be very irritating I guess but I think what Clifford was saying earlier is, is ultimately what it comes down to, and I think that's why um, the attitude you have is so valuable, because Clifford was talking about truth, and, and, and Nancy was too, I think, in your work. Now, how can you be honest in your work if you're worrying about what people think? You can't, can you? You have to let that go. Mm -hmm. You have to just say, oh, to heck with it. Absolutely. I'm just going to do what I do. Absolutely. And if, if nobody likes it, does it matter? Right, uh, exactly. Well, yeah. Does it though, really? I mean, um, well, I, 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 do you have enough courage in, in, in your, because uh, I don't, in, enough courage in your work that you can say, I don't give a hoot if nobody likes this. Well, I, I want enough people to like it to allow me to keep playing <laughs> and keep playing shows and uh, so keep it self-sustaining. But, you know, in the end of the, at the end of the day, I like it. The musicians who play with me like it and our families like it. And so... I think the point is we would do this in spite of abject failure, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, financially or you know, career-wise. I don't care if I'm working in McDonald's so long as I'm still writing and I'm you know, getting the words on the page. It doesn't bother me what I'm doing in my day job. I would still be writing anyway, just in my head. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't put down the guitar just because I didn't book any shows anymore. I'd still play. <laughs> I'd still write. <laughs> That's, that's, that's why you, that's why you're yeah. good at what you do. <laughs> exactly. That's why Nancy's good at what she does. Right. That, that's well, to be honest with you, um, that is always the um, acknowledgement that I'm hoping for from musicians who want me to listen to their work. I don't care if you listen to it or not. I'm still going to do it. <laughs> you know? Right. And if they say that, of course I'm going to listen to it. Mm -hmm. You know, because I want to hear what you have to say. Because you're not trying to ingratiate yourself. You're just saying what you're feeling and thinking. So it's probably going to be valuable mm -hmm. because it's honest, you know. Right. And, you know, you've got to, to be able to write stuff and play shows and take the time to record it and all that. You have to kind of believe in what you're doing. You have to kind of have a, a, a little bit of pride in it and feel like that, you know, this is worth something even if it's just to me and my friends, mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like, you know, I've worked hard on this. I want some people to hear it, so. But, but, but at the same time, you know, you hear all this. Uh, I, I guess the best example in recent history is is the Swedish producers. Um, I can't remember his name, Max something. There's a bunch of people in Sweden making pop music in, in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. And basically what they did was they figured out hooks and how, and, and it's, 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 I guess you can make the same argument about ABBA and their music. It's so obviously created as as a, a, a kind of uh, irresistible artifact, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the melody 
you hate yourself for liking it. That kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bit, bit what Michael was talking about. You know? <laughs> yeah. I never rejected Abba. And yet it's so unbelievably ingratiating. Yeah. You know? I mean, they got yeah. some very poppy things out there. Yeah. But they had a few soulful songs. I mean, yeah. you know, they were songwriters as well. It's not like the Monkees that were a contrived band put together for a show who then later learned to play, right? ironically, and became a relatively successful pop band. They weren't contrived. I mean, you know, they were put together for the Eurovision Song Contest, that's true, but they wrote their own material. And that, you know, I think that garners a lot of respect. I've tried, I've got to a point in my life where I've tried not to judge people too much for their musical <laughs> taste. Because if you read, it's if you impossible. Think about, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and that's true. But also, if you consider that there's so many, so much diversity, so many people in so many subgroups and subgenres. Yeah, that's for sure. And so many people who grew up exposed to different things, there might be something that I just abhor, but it might touch somebody else on an emotional level. Death metal and, for me. Yeah, right. And I don't want <laughs> to, <laughs> as a musician, I don't want to rain on their parade. If there's some music that moves somebody like that, I don't want to belittle that publicly anyway. No, I, you know, I, I don't know. At this point, the only thing I really care about is, is does the person who's making the music care about it? Or, or are they simply trying to create a commercial artifact. Right, right. If, if they are, you... are, and they say, this is what I'm doing, great, because I like that too. Mm -hmm. But let's not confuse one with the other. Right, You know. right. So there's there's a a point where you're not a musician, you're a, you're a marketer. You're a producer. Right. Yeah. Well, as right. you say, with writing, you get writers that are hacks, that just churn out the same thing over and over mm -hmm. again without with little care or interest for developing characters beyond the two-dimensional. They're just, you know cashing in on a trend. My, my question, and I, I, I don't know if either you or Clifford or, or Nancy or Jason can answer it, I just wonder how it feels to know that that's the kind of writer or singer that you are, that you're just going through the motions. You're doing. Uh, I think you, you have know. to look at your bank balance at that point. If it's sufficiently swelling enough, I think you can live with it. <laughs> True. You know, I mean, if it meant so much to you, you, you would do something artistic and meaningful if it really meant that much. If you were just in it for the money, you better be making the money. What are you going to do with the money? Well, well whatever it was is, that is really it, um, to my life, point, My point being, is, is, is that really compensation for, for that feeling you have that the, the work you're doing is kind of hollow? Well, that's the author of Fifty Shades of Grey, how well she's doing now. I'm sure she'd be pretty chuffed. I mean, <laughs> she's not going to win any literary awards, but... You know, she can buy a small island in the Bahamas now. If 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 the the stuff you're you're doing is entertaining, or even if if one person enjoys it, and this is kind of a circular argument. I realise from what we've been saying, I don't see anything wrong with that at all. No, I well, don't, I don't the only thing that bothers that. me is somebody who, as the kind of person you were describing, that is writing it simply because, yeah. you know, on a commission kind of thing. Yeah, a cynical exploitation or something just to cash in, I think, is a little bit. You know, it's pathetic. a bit of a betrayal, I think. But of course, you know, people have to eat and they have to work and so on and so and so be it. And if they're successful, you know, all power to them. Uh, I don't really begrudge people's success. I particularly don't like Harry Potter series. I think J.K. Rowling's not that great a writer, but she's very successful and great, wonderful. She's the most successful writer probably since Tolkien, I'm, I'm sure. But um, I would prefer Tolkien any day, frankly. But I, I would suggest that what she shares in common with you, Michael, she's a really good storyteller. Well, that's very nice. And, and you, you are a man who knows how to spin a tale. I know <laughs> that from the last time you were here. Uh, Jason, I wanted to um, give everybody a breather and play a song from your album. Okay. Uh, what song do you think I should play? Um, well, if you want a song that kind of tells a story, you should probably play uh, Eton, Georgia, which is um, it's kind of a... It's set in a small little town in Georgia next to where I grew up, and it's just a couple breaking up on a night in Eton, Georgia. I don't mean to bore you, but here we are in Eton, Georgia. Stopped at the only traffic light Your face 
softly glowing red Feel this pain in my head And I don't see any end in sight down from Tennessee So you could spend the day with me For eleven seems endless How was I to know it in like this? Guess Jason Lyles, who has his guitar with him. Love that cello, man. Me too. We talked about that the other day, didn't <laughs> mm -hmm. we? Just yeah, it adds so much. It it's, does. Yeah, yeah. It just flows through the whole song. Right, and when she she goes into that solo, mm -hmm. so sweet. I love. So how it. did the how did the gig go with with, with uh, all those musicians? Oh, it was great. We had such a great time out at Wanderlinger. Um, uh, Corey ran the sound and lights and did such a good job and it was just you know warm friendly atmosphere tons of friends coming in and it was just just a good time and so i think uh, in the band which are you know relatively new playing together they were just a lot of good bonding experience just hanging out with them and uh, just looking forward to the next one what are you gonna do now um i'm gonna do a song uh called checking out which is also on the album, um, and this is a song about, um, you know, when we, we were speaking earlier about taking your own experiences and filtering them into something. This is at a point in my life before I was teaching that I was working for this company and they were sending me around to all these hotel rooms and, and things and I just wanted to go home and I felt like it just, it just I just felt useless. And so I, uh, I wrote a song about it. It's called Checking Out, as in I want to be checking out of the hotel and leaving. <laughs> Were you just staying in the hotel to, to be in a, a given place to do something else, or was it all to do with the hotel? Uh, it was just being away from home and not feeling very useful at what I was doing. I was going to some conferences and some places in Texas and California, and it was just kind of like, what am I doing here? Mm. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> so... 
This is called uh, Checking Out. Take me home In the sky on the road Just take me home Take a plane, take a boat Just let me go home Please just get me there Whatever the price I'll pay And you fear Take me home, take me Sky on the road Just take me home Take a plane, take a boat Just let me go home Please just get me there Whatever the price I'll pay Anything, take me home Take me home Take me Take me, take me home. Take me, 